Servus and hello, Matthias Eichler here and this, this is Single Track. Before we dive into this week's episode, I want to remind everyone that our early bird pricing for Saturnalia ends on Halloween. Come and race our fun and festive holiday 10K at Squawkson Park in Olympia on December 16th. RockCandyRunning.com has all the info. Hope to see you out there. All right, on to this week's show. After having met virtually on Mastodon, West Plate and I ran into each other in person at last week's U.S. Trail Running Conference in Muckleteer, Washington. Wes runs long, and I mean really long distances. In many ways, I can't even wrap my head around days of running on end. But I do understand and marvel at the motivation and the storytelling through creative route creation. His latest project of running 200 miles around the Puget Sound in Western Washington is both equally mind-blowing and inspiring. Here's Wes to tell that story and share a bit about his first foray into race directing with his first race, the Copper Kings 100 in Montana, slated for the summer of 2024. Wes Plate on single track. Welcome. This is exciting to have you. Yeah, this is a thrill. What a fun thing. Yes, I mean, I thrill, right? I mean, we're both like remotely sitting in our little like offices, right? <laughs> But it is a thrill because we just met in person. So history for our listeners, we randomly met through Mastodon, I suppose, right? How long have you been on Mastodon? You seem like somebody who was longer on it than me. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a great question. Maybe less than a year, though. I don't feel like it's been very long. Uh, I kind of, I didn't use Twitter very much, but um, I had a bit of a community on Twitter that, you know, that I enjoyed checking in on. And then as uh, people started to flee Twitter to go to various different places, um, I, you know, people, a lot of people I knew are starting to head towards Mastodon. So I've, I've been checking it out and then it's kind of, it's been fun to sort of experience some new friends there. And, um, you know, it's sort of a community is building there. And yes, that's how I think we started to interact with each other. I think I knew your name because of the podcast that I've listened to, uh, but uh, yeah, we hadn't really ever talked or met before. So yeah, we met virtually online first. Yeah, that's amazing. So quickly to Twitter before we bury that that um, that carcass. Um, the community that you had, was that a running community or was that more from your tech side, from your real job side? Uh, I think on Twitter, my community was mostly my sort of my job side. Mm -hmm. Um, my background is in video editing and then I work on the tech side, making tools for video editors. So I had a lot of people on Twitter who I followed and interacted with who were either video editors or were software people making video editing tools. But at the same time, Twitter was fantastic for following an event. Like Mm -hmm. uh, I would always get on Twitter to follow the Barkley marathon updates or the, the backyard ultra updates. There was, that's where the place was where the conversation was happening. And in fact, this morning I was kind of on social media, like where's the updates for the backyard ultra stuff. There's very little out there. And so I think that's a real shame that, you know, that Twitter did what it did, but <laughs> so, 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 so we put it, no, it's true. And I think there are two things to it on one side, you know, Musk obviously shot a dead horse, but beyond that, I think so much of it has moved to live streaming that sort of these Twitter updates, because I remember like the early days of being on Iran, uh, you know, following the Iran far messages, which were sort of literally the only pieces of information we could uh, gather from these big events and even at Barclay, you still only get little text messages, right? But most other events have since now moved to some kind of video streaming. And so you can check in there. And so the sort of like, hey, I saw a runner come through an aid station isn't quite as relevant anymore. And so I think it's a sort of two-pronged death kneel to <laughs> the, the the Twitter thing. Yeah. So for, for me, I moved to Mastodon. I mean, I had heard of Mastodon years ago, but I was so reluctant to move over. And then eventually I moved. And then I found that uh, mountain dot social server, mountains dot social that is hosted by um, 
a really great person in Europe. And that was done for me. Like, okay, I think that that can be a home. Mountains yeah. are my home virtually. <laughs> <laughs> so we met on Mastodon, chatted for a bit, and but then we saw each other in person and I had no idea. I mean, I saw kind of right through your messages that you not just run here and there, but you're like a mega serious, super long distance, crazy ultra runner. But then we saw each other at a U.S. trail running conference that just happened in Mukilteo in uh, Western Washington. And I mean, I had no idea that you'd be there. And I mean, it was sort of spontaneous for you, too, because you're not like a 10 year long history of being a race director. Yeah, well, it was I feel like it was a bit of a a nice coincidence last year at about this time. Uh, I saw on Strava that somebody that I follow had gone on a, a group run in Mukilteo, which is very close to where I live, uh, for this thing called the U.S. Trail Running Conference. And I thought to myself, what is this conference happening in the town I live in? How come I didn't know about it? And so um, I looked into it and learned that it was sort of for, trail, for race directors. And a, about a year ago, I was starting to have an, an idea that I might want to try to put on an event and you know, pretend to be a race director. So uh, I sort of bookmarked my calendar to say, hey, I'm going to keep that weekend open for 2023. And when when uh, registration opened up, I signed up and I figured, hey, it'll be a chance for me to meet some new people and learn some things and uh, maybe even see some existing race director friends. So yeah, it was it was my first time uh, attending as, as a want to be race director. I haven't yet put on an event, but um yeah, it was a really a neat opportunity for me to be there amongst some experienced people who know what they're doing. It is it is an interesting intersection of people that show up there, right? It's by no means a large conference, right? I mean, they're very, you know, barely 100 people there total. But you do get Greg Thornley from Western States and Tim Tollefson from Mammoth Trail Fest and every other fame there is. Um, and so you get sort of the some of the big guys show up, but then I think because of the size of the conference and the geograph geography of the country, right? You don't get a lot of race directors from the East coast or you know, the Southeast or so, right? It's, it becomes sort of a, a weird combination. How was it for you as being sort of a possible wanting to be first time race director going into that and sort of being thrown into these sometimes even intense conversations around, you know, how do we as race directors sort of manage our communities? Well, I thought of just, I thought of it as an opportunity just to soak in the experience and learn. Um, I, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know really what even the sessions were necessarily going to be about, but I just thought that I would just be in the room and just listen and as much as I could and pick up nuggets here and there. And then if I had the opportunity to ask somebody a question, that would be a great thing. And of course, part of the, the whole thing for me is to meet other people and um, learn who's out there and who I could ask questions to. And, and also everyone was very inviting. I, I told my story about how I ended up there and the event that I think I want to put on. And everyone that I spoke to was really, really encouraging and made me feel like I was in the right place and doing the right things. But also, even the people who have done it before, you know, they kind of encouraged me to say that everybody is still figuring it out. Nobody really knows what they're doing. And I think maybe some of the people who have been doing it for a long time, they probably know what they're doing more than they let on. But um, a lot of people, especially when they start out, don't know what they're doing and they're figuring it out as they go. So that was just, I think that was a nice and encouraging for me that as I'm going through the permit application process, not knowing what it's supposed to look like, just guessing, you know, not knowing that the other people who have succeeded were in that exact same place. So being in that, up, being in that room and meeting those people was, was great. And I felt like it was a wonderful use of my time to expand my network. So that yeah, was great. No, that's, that's really great to hear. I think the people who do show up, they're really interested in sharing. They are not, sort of off this this mindset that, you know, they need to keep things for themselves, right? I mean, I think that there is definitely an interest in sharing in the general excitement about what it means to be a race director and be 
sort of this welcoming host to this community that puts themselves out there into these somewhat sometimes precarious situations and you're trying to keep them safe, right? But on the other side, also this willingness to share just very practical tidbits, right? Very much like, you know, this is where you should, I don't know, buy your Gatorade because it's cheaper or something like that, right? I mean, babe, it's right. even simple things like that. But you, 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 you're commenting on an interesting point and that's the permitting. And I think that's, one of those things that's fascinating that because most of our lands we run on our public lands and sort of there's a government agency, there is no real advantage to be a super organized corporate entity coming in, right? I mean, if you sort of would roll up with some lawyers to say that this is how we do this permitting, you're not really winning anything. Currently, as of at this state in our sort of world of trail running literally you with just an idea is much have much a chance of getting a permit than you know iron man is if they would if they would come in and that's kind of a fascinating thing right yeah it is really fascinating yeah and i guess that's encouraging too it's good to know that you know i have just as much chance to to get my permit uh but what is but what i find interesting you know, outside of the opportunity to meet race directors in an, through a, something like a conference like this one, is I just feel like most people are just left to reinvent the wheel um, all on their own without knowing how other people have invented their wheels. So every race director is out there with the same stresses, uh, trying to figure out the same answers to the same questions. Where do they buy this? Where do they get this from? Who are they going to sponsor? Who, who's going to sponsor? And I just feel like that sort of... Um, need for everyone to to have to figure it out on their own is, is kind of a shame. I hope that if I'm successful in becoming a race director, that I can be one of those who will share the knowledge with others and help them along the way. Because uh, without without examples and without templates, it's just really hard to know if you're even moving in the right direction sometimes. Mm -hmm. I think there's an, there's an interesting thing. I, I follow, I'm a part of a race director Facebook group. And people often call or ask question of like, hey, I'm trying to do a 5K fund run in my city as a fundraiser for this nonprofit. What's, what's, where's the template, right? What, what do I need to do? Where do I get my permit? Where do I get my medals? Where do I get my t-shirts, right? How do I mark my, mark my course? And I mean, obviously there are a million more 5K fundraising fun runs than trail races out there. And so there is a little bit more of this template, but I think the more you have templates, the more we as race director lose our sort of competitive edge because if everybody can just follow a template, I mean, that's sort of knowing where to get not just the permit and insurance, but also the Gatorade or whatever, right? Where, where you get these things is in some respect the secret sauce that makes us race directors um, sort of successful in this. And as it's as it would get more templated, right? Then I think it loses some of this, some of this magic. Because in many ways, when you hear these race directors, I mean, especially your crazy long distances that you are running with the amount of permits that people need to hold and just the logistics my races are so small that i i you know, barely need any volunteers right but mm. these big ones um i mean there is so much black box that goes on and like how do you get volunteers right how do you sort of convince somebody to um give up you know precious five days to sit somewhere in the woods um, at an aid station waiting for 30 runners to come by to complain about their blisters, right? I mean, right, it's, yeah. it's sort of a crazy, crazy world of, that we are building out. Yeah, no, that's true. Uh, and, and, you know, and just as I go through this, I'm just hoping that it all, everything will, you know, happen as it will and that I'll, I'll hopefully the permits will come through. I'm at the process, a stage of the process right now where I have, uh, a draft of my application that uh, a couple of friends have offered to have a look at just to see if, you know, if I'm on the right track or not. Uh, so I'm really lucky to have friends like that. Um, yeah. And then hopefully in the next week or so, I'll be able to talk to my forest service contact and say, Hey, it's time for you to have a look, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. let's, let's cross our fingers and see if we're heading in the right direction. Yeah. yeah so it. we'll see. And I don't know how many of these agencies are sort of have a different approach, but in my experience, they, 
as, as long as you put something reasonable serious forward they're willing to tell you it's not like an exam where they're like fail you can't apply for the next three years right it's more like hey we 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 are considering overall your application but um the one section that you're going through there will be some active logging for that year or right i mean they they, they will usually come back to you and allow you to sort of work with them um and and so that's sort of a good way that you're not one shot and done, right? That takes oh, a yeah, so that is the, encouraging. Yeah, a little bit of the pressure. Well, we talked about a whole bunch uh, that you that you're working on something. You haven't really said what it is. <laughs> we you should tell our listeners you're working on a race in Montana. So tell people about it. Yeah. So um, well, the listeners may not know I'm a lo- I'm an ultra runner, and you've kind of hinted that I run long distances. I've um, run a, I've started seven hundreds if I, if that's right. And I think I've finished five of them, but I've also done nine two hundreds, um, and then lots of 50 Ks and a couple of 50 milers and a hundred Ks in there. Uh, what I've really gravitated, gravitated to are the longer distance runs. And one of the things that I found when I do these races is that I get very connected to the land and that space that I'm moving across on my own two feet. Um, in a way that I can't get connected to it by just driving across that valley or something. And um, so that's sort of the, I have this attitude about really enjoying nature when I'm running. Um, And I have this separately, I have a back, my family's background is that they're from Butte, Montana, uh, between Missoula and Bozeman on I-90. Um, I visited there a million times as a kid. Both my parents were born and grew up there. I have cousins and aunts who still live there. And it's just, I've had a, my grandfather was a county commissioner and was well-liked man who was really bringing a lot of beauty and, and revitalization to the community. So I have this long history with that place. Um, and I had this idea a couple of years ago that it might be really special to me emotionally if I could identify some key points in my family's history and just for myself run between those places so that I could get that connection to the ground that I feel when I, when I do something epic like the Coca Dona 250. So I was running or I was making these maps kind of uh, imagining how this run might go. And over time, this idea just sort of morphed and it developed into more of a, a looping idea instead of just sort of this strange out and back that didn't really look very interesting. Um, and then last summer, the summer of 2022, I uh, I needed to, I didn't need to, I, for my 49th birthday, I thought I'm going to run 49 miles. And how about if I go off and run the first half of this idea of this loop that I've started to create in Butte, Montana, to see if it's even possible to get through some of these areas. And I had a really successful birthday run. I really enjoyed the course and I enjoyed the area. And um, so it cemented an idea that this whole 100 mile loop really needs to be run. And so, um, my, uh, my fiance and I sort of, we set out some plans and I invited some friends to join me. And in June of 2023, this year, uh, five other people joined me and we ran this hundred mile loop that I had been thinking about around Butte, Montana. And, uh, it was just a really neat experience and it kind of helped cement the idea that this is a really great route and, uh, we should turn it into an actual event. So that was sort of the how the idea started, and and so it brought me to the point where I've you know met with the Forest Service and lots of other agencies and had lots of conversations about what would it take for this idea to turn into an event, and um, it's been great to talk to local runners in Butte who are really enthusiastic about this idea. They really want to have something like this. There's right now only one 100 miler in Montana, the Crazy mm-hmm. Mountain 100, and so last summer or this last summer in 2023, I went and volunteered at that race just to help, you know, help that community out. And, um, even while I was there, I could just get that sense that there's an appetite for hundred milers in Montana. And so, um, yeah, with, if everything goes well, uh, a race called the copper Kings 100 will be held on Friday, June 28th in Butte, Montana, our inaugural year. And, um, yeah, it's a 100 mile single loop it goes, starts and finishes in the town of Butte and then uses about 65 miles of the Continental Divide Trail uh, and just goes through some really beautiful forests and has some epic views. And it's just a real neat celebration of a really interesting area with uh, with a really fascinating history. 
I mean, you're you're selling it really, really well. I think you have, <laughs> you know, we 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 talked about sort of the practicalities of putting on on a race, and we talked about sort of the, the logistics and stuff. But in the end, in order for people to get people out there, um, you need to also tell the romance, right? Yeah, is then you need to share why somebody should come out there what's out there you can take lots of great photos and stuff but there is a little bit of a story that you need to tell and i think you told that story the beginnings of the story really really well and i think that sounds that sounds amazing and obviously having the personal connection to the land uh, makes it makes it extra special yeah i'm really excited to share this with other people when when we did our little fat ass back in June, we had f uh, two runners from Montana who were, live within an hour of Butte who joined us. And then four people, including myself from out of state. And I asked everybody afterwards if, if having done this run, if it sort of changed the way they thought about Butte in any way, uh, because one of the runners had actually told me that before they started that their brother had called them and, and had said like, why are you running in Butte, Montana? That place is, you know, ugly and terrible and awful. And uh, I think that a lot of people would have an interesting view of Butte if all they've ever done is driven through on their way somewhere else. Because it's because of the mining history of uh, the, that region, there is a lot of huge tailings piles. And it does, it kind of looks like the aftermath of an environmental disaster. And, uh, so to to have these people come, even the locals were like, "Oh my god, I so much I see Butte so differently now because we got to experience the outer limits of these some of these trail systems and and really be inside beauty, while at the same time we are running amongst the some of the remnants of mines. It's it's just an interesting uh, trail that goes or a course it goes through this sort of historical area and kind of touches on the history." But at the same time, really celebrating the natural beauty of the area that most people don't really, I think, recognize. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's an interesting part because, you know, there are some people who know that like Bozeman, Montana is an epic for trail, epic place for trail running. There's a lot of there, a lot of people running there. It's really popular. And I think a place like Butte has the potential to attract, you know, many, many people to come there and, and explore the trails. And so I'm hoping that I can just be a piece of that puzzle to bring people into the area and, and help them appreciate what is a really spectacular region. Oh, fantastic. That sounds great. Yeah. So for your fat ass, I mean, you had several people. How do you, did you do the logistics? Did you have food, food and water, cash? The, how, how did you sort of set this up? Because what did you carry everything? Yeah, great question. I, um, uh... I invited some people to come along and I basically made it really clear to them. They were like, you're on your own. Like we're going to, we'll, I'm going to give you a GPX file and, and tell you where the course is, but I want you to bring your own crew to follow you along and meet you at the de designated crew stops. Uh, and then um, we did end up with one aid station. I'll say in quotation marks that we weren't, that crew wasn't able to access because of, um, it was in a, a private property location that they couldn't get to. So we arranged with that property owner that we, could, we would be allowed to have an aid station there. And so my mom and my dad and two other uh, locals from Butte actually joined them. And we put up a tent and we actually set up a little mini aid station there with drop bags that the runners could provide and some water and snacks. Um, but for the most part, all the runners were self-supported with their own crews. Um, there was no course marking. So everyone, I asked them to be sure they had their course on a device, like in, on their phone. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so therefore the logistics became fairly simple for me. I, I did write up a runner's guide with, uh, course descriptions and, you know, tried to get into just all the information that I would provide a runner if the event was a real event. And I felt like that was a good, that was good practice for me um, to do the things that I would do if I was a race director. And then um, it, throughout the run, there were probably, everyone was, there was, I think there was two runners who were always like, they ran together. And then the rest of us just sort of ping ponged off each other and little yo-yoed back and forth. We ran with them sometimes. I ran with David, ran with Dave, ran with Rebecca sometimes. Um, but logistically, I just sort of put the onus on each person that you need to have your own stuff. And that seemed to work out pretty well. 
everyone had a great time. In fact, when I would come into one of these aid stations, these crew stops, you know, all the other crews would be there waiting for their runners. And it was, it felt like a real event because everyone's cheering us in as we come mm-hmm. in. And uh, it was, it was neat to, to experience how much of an event you can feel, even if it isn't an actual event, just the fact that we just had a few friends kind of hanging out made it feel like we were doing something special. And in the end, it was a great memory and everyone had a really neat time. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad we did it. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, it's it's cool too that as you're envisioning putting on a race on that course, you sort of ran the whole thing because especially for these long distances, sometimes a race director, I mean, I don't think, I mean, you know, if the guys from Cocodona ever ran the whole 250 miles in one go before they did Yeah, I don't race, think they did. Right? It was probably just in segments, yeah. You run it in segments and then you put the pieces together, right? Um, and so having sort of experienced it all in one go, I think is is good because it also gives you a little bit of an idea of like um, temperature and climate and timing and daylight and everything, right? So I think that's an interesting piece. Now... We need to talk a little bit about sort of your larger running history because you're so comfortable with these, what I call insane long distances. I mean, this is, I mean, to be quite frank, it's it's too much. My head can't really wrap itself around that, not just time on feet, but also like the entire logistics of getting yourself there. And you speak about this for this fat ass that, you know, the drop bag management, your crew and stuff. I mean, it's a lot beyond the actual running, right? I mean, yeah. what fascinates you about this? How do you put these pieces together? Well, I think the thing about this, the long distance things, especially the 200 plus mile range is where I feel most comfortable running these days, or I should <laughs> maybe comfortable is not the right word, but I, it is the <laughs> distance that I, that attracts me the most. It, it is a lot of logistics to to join any of these events. Um, we, I spent a lot of time on spreadsheets trying to get an idea of when might I be in certain parts of the course and what gear am I going to need for those segments? Um, what food am I going to want to eat? And I have had a crew at every one of my 200s. And so uh, I you know, think a lot about what they're going to be doing. And also I plan their logistics. Where are they going to stay? And what are they going to drive? And um, there's, there's a thing that Steve Adderholt, the race director for Cocodona 250 told me that he believes that there's something special that happens when runners have been out on a course for more than three days, that there's something special about this three day mark that really is sort of especially life-changing. And I have found that to be true in my own running history because I, my first time hitting the 200 mile race mark was when I did the Moab 240 in 2019. I just had, I just had an incredible experience. And then when I did Cocodona 250 for the first time in 2021, that was my second 200. And it started to just really cement in me that that's the distance that I am attracted to. Part of it was because over time throughout the event, I find myself sort of changing and, and, and healing and growing where by that third day, this sort of, sort of magical time frame that Steve Adderholt talked about, things are different. There is something really special and magical that starts happening. The first time I ran, when I ran Moab, I actually got injured around, around halfway, around mile 120. I was on a super steep climb and something in a hamstring just got a little bit tweaked. And so for the next day, I couldn't run. I would attempt to run even slowly, but it hurt too bad. So I was reduced to hiking. However, I could hike fast. Like I could hike a 15 minute mile uh, and it wouldn't hurt. But the moment I tried to run a 15 minute mile, I couldn't do it. But then over the course of that, the next day or two, I started to get a little bit better so that by, I think it was day, day, maybe day three and a half or day four, I was starting to be able to run again. So it's amazing that you can actually have an injury in one of these events and heal as the event is continuing on so that by the time you get to the finish you're actually better off um and yeah and as i've done it over and over i've just had this experience where uh that that third day starts to become pretty magical where i almost have this runner's high throughout the day and i'm running really well and i'm feeling really good Uh, so it's it's become it's just really special to me what what happens over this sort of like my own 
personal evolution. I can feel it happening over the course of these events. Uh, it, it's just, it's, it's hard to express because the distances are so long uh, and it's hard. It's hard for me to make sense of this idea that, yeah, day one is kind of hard for me. I have a, I have a tough time getting through it, but I know that if I can just get through it, it'll be okay because day two is better. And then day three is even better. And sometimes if it's a longer one and I go into a day four, day four is really good. Um, and it's just, my experience has taught me that that's the way it goes for me, but yeah, it's, it's special. I think that's, it's hard to, it's, I need a better word for it, but there's something really special out there. I, I can't process it. I mean, I trust you, right? But I can't process it because for me, the shorter distances, and perhaps that, that, that forms into a question, but for me, the shorter distances, I can, I can, I know I can trust my body to know that I can sort of mentally control, because they're, in running, there's sort of two levels in racing. There is following a good plan so you're not breaking down right i mean you need to make sure you keep your nutrition in and stuff and then you have to also like re you can't just be a robot you have to also connect to the moment and try to float and i personally have a really hard time unlocking that sort of after 50 miles it gets really really hard and i get into my head so for you on these like super long distances and I, I hear a lot of people expressing who are running long distances that they're connecting to sort of these, this float space. But in that moment, how much are you still connecting to your rigorous spreadsheet of like, I need to eat, you need to take care of my body? Like, how do you balance this day three? It's kind of funny. I, I, I spend so much time on that spreadsheet. Uh, but once the race starts, I don't think, I don't think I ever look at it again. It's like, uh, it, it's just something for me to plan. It's something for me to feel like I've done what I've needed to do to arrive at the starting line prepared. Once the race starts, it's, it's, we kind of just start to go on instinct. Now, at least that's for me. Now, my, mm -hmm. my crew, uh, Leah will have taken a bunch of notes about what my plans were. And so I think she might be a bit more referring to what we had intended to do like you know when we get to this town or this aid station you know we're going to change shoes and so we kind of have have a little bit of a plan that she's keeping in mind um but i kind of start to just go into just whatever feels right mode and eating what feels right and um because also what i've started to learn is day one i'm i'm starting to have worse and worse day ones where i think in the last few events i've done every time at some point in day one, I'm vomiting. Uh, I can barely eat anything and it starts to feel really uncomfortable to the point where I kind of want to quit because I am just not having a great time. Um, but it's to me, the, 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 all the planning and stuff is just a way for me to feel like I, I have a plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, and knowing that I've done everything I could to get ready for the moment. And now I'm going to rely on my experience to actually, actually navigate the, the actual event um, and, and adjust as necessary based on how events have me actually feeling on the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, that speaks to a huge level of experience and maturity and to be able to sort of navigate and be in tune with your body to both listen and know what your body needs, right? Because you're expending so many calories and energy. Like you do need to stay on top of all of these things, right? You can't just sort of allow yourself to be completely in the moment. Right? There is a level of, you know, I mean, especially on these long days, hey, a blister might be forming. I need to take care of that, right? I mean, you, right, you, yeah. there is sort of this um very very tunely listen to these kind of things so uh and to be able to sort of balance it out and not put yourself into this panic place of like oh i gotta oh, uh, 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 oh right but actually wow i'm here this will be fine is it speaks a lot to your experience um that sounds amazing but you still haven't convinced me that a 200 mile should ever be on my agenda <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if I'll just say, I'll just say one more thing about 200s in general, which is that they're not as hard as people think. Mm -hmm. And I've heard other 200 finishers say the same thing. 
uh, especially when we talk to 100 mile runners. I think a lot of 100 milers, people who've done hundreds, they're like, oh my God, 100 miles are so hard. I can't imagine doing 200. And I think the, the dirty little secret is that it's a little bit easier to do a 200 than it is to do a 100. The intensity is a lot lower. Mm-hmm. Um, that just the trade off is it just takes a lot longer. So uh, while while the amount of physical effort I feel like is lower, you just have to be used, get used to the idea of being out on your feet for a very long time. You know, being extremely tired because the the exhaustion is what really gets you. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's it's not for everyone. But I am amazed at how many people are willing to give it a try because. Yeah. A lot of us have had really neat experiences running 200 miles. I mean, I am fascinated um, for sure. And I'm hugely impressed with people who do take this thing on. But I just don't believe that they're not as hard as 100 miles. <laughs> because <laughs> everyone says it and I'm like, no way, no. But I mean, I get your point. I think you're right. I think there is some truth to that, that you you have a little bit more time you have a little bit more dedicated aid stations you're not trying to race as much right i mean there is a little bit more of a focus of just being out there for days and knowing that you are going to be out there for days you're not trying to put, cram everything into the first 24 hours right the first, the first 24 hours are just a warm up so i get I, I i get the basic the basic gist of it now Let's speak about, talk about your crazy adventure around the Puget Sound. I mean, you're here from Western Washington. Puget Sound is this crazy body of water that connects us all. And you just ran by yourself, I mean, with a friend, but without a race, 200 miles around the Puget Sound. It's somewhat unfathomable, and I don't even know how to... um, put this in terms so we have to absolutely have to make sure we put a good map into the show notes so people can kind of see what that entailed but you have to like start from the beginning and walk us through inspiration planning preparation this is an insane thing especially outside of it being a race where you don't have all the people sort of taking care of you yeah this was an interesting idea that uh thankfully took off and it's been really wild to see, have conversations in the aftermath of it with so many people and have so many people think this was a really interesting and wild idea. I, so I've done a number of these long 200 mile events and I, I think they're great. I enjoy them. And I, I, I kind of am intrigued by some of the other events that are out there that are road based. Um, uh, last annual heart of the South Vol state, these sort of 500 kilometer road events down in the Southeast. I'm curious about them. And one of the things that I really wondered about is, boy, how much, how painful is it to run that many miles on asphalt? You know, us all, all of us trail runners, we like to complain about any time we have to touch the road, right? Um, and I certainly don't like running on the road that much. I'll do it when I have to. But um, I was inspired to just have this idea. My question was, how painful is it? So uh, I talked to my buddy, Dave Stinchfield, who I've run a bu- run together with at many 200s. And uh, I said to him, I said, hey, uh, would you be interested in doing a 200-mile road thing with me? I'm just putting it together just so we can see what it would be like. And he he was <laughs> interested. <laughs> what, what an amazing friend. He said, sure. Let's. He gave me a date that worked for him. And so I think it was back in February that we started having this conversation. And so, and in that February timeframe, he had set out October 12 was a day that he could do this. And so um, I, I just, I took a look at a map and thought, what would it be like to run just around Puget Sound? And so did a quick look at a map and uh, it wasn't quite 200 miles. And so I started tweaking my idea and then I found how I could get close to 200 miles um, and the inspiration was just, what would it be like? And then the location became this area here, the Puget Sound, cause this is, I guess where I live. And I had this idea having been, um, on parts of what ended up being our course many times over the years, I knew that there were going to be some neat views that we would get to see a lot of interesting things along the way. And I also as I got into the mapping of it, really tried to give ourselves some pavement breaks here and there by having little trail connectors where we could. So I think we ran maybe something like nine, 
nine miles in to the, well, first off, we ran 11 miles to, or nine miles to a ferry boat, took the ferry across to Whidbey Island, ran about nine miles on pavement on Whidbey Island. And then we had about three miles of beautiful trail. It was so nice. And so we ended up, you know, sort of doing this like little bit of trail, a bunch of road, a little bit of trail, a bunch of road. And similar to what I had done at the Copper Kings 100 fat ass is um, we had designated crew stops. So we set up locations of essentially aid stations and Dave had his crew. His wife was following him. I had my crew. My fiance, Leah was following me. And uh, we just, we set it out in such a way that we, it kind of felt like an event. It's just that there was only two participants in it. Um, and yeah, we, the, the route would, took us all the way up North through Whidbey Island. And Whidbey Island is a really big Island actually. So mm-hmm. uh, we were uh, on Whidbey Island for a very long time. We crossed Deception Pass onto Fidalgo Island, which is where the city of Anacortes is. But before we got to Anacortes, we climbed to the top of Mount Erie, which is about, a, I think, 1,500 feet high or something. So we had a pretty decent climb and also on a nice trail break to get off the roads. Um, and then from there, we uh, ran to La Conner, uh, to a place called Conway, down to Stanwood. And then we circumnavigated Camino Island, uh, got back to Stanwood, and then headed down through um, to Kayak Point, which is a county park in Snohomish County. And then we ran through the Tulalip Reservation, uh, had a, our, our last aid station stop uh, in Tulalip, and then ran to Marysville, and then eventually back to Everett, where we had started. And uh, yeah, it was mostly roads, a little bit of trails. Um, and you know, along the way, as over the over the course of the last several months, yeah, I have been doing a bunch of recon and, you know, it's one, it's one thing to have an idea on a map, but I kind of wanted to make sure that we were actually going to be able to do this thing. So I had spent a lot of time uh, both running, driving, and bicycling lots of parts of the course to make sure that it was actually feasible and doable. And so th- that all those things were really helpful and helped to refine the route that we ended up taking. Um, but yeah, in the end, I think according to Strava, I ended up at 204.3 miles. Uh, we finished in 69 hours and 11 minutes. Um, which is, I'm really, I'm really surprised that we were so far under 72 hours. Cause we were not in any hurry. We, mm-hmm. we slept a lot. We probably slept seven hours total. Uh, we weren't, even when we were running, we weren't really, you know, in any hurry. We did a lot of hiking and, um, but it was also a lot of fun. It was hard and challenging and stressful, um, running so close to cars mm-hmm. that are driving very fast was scary. Um, but at the same time, in order to do a th- something like this, you kind of just have to just accept that that's going to be a part of it and yeah. do your best to make sure the cars know you're there. Um, but uh, yeah, that's how that's how it happened. Do you use the Strava route builder to sort of map this out? Or what tool do you use to even like kind of come up with the route? I, uh, I use a, a couple of different tools. Um, it was a website called Plot a Route plotaroot.com okay um i used uh a lot of uh cal topo and uh and then i also i had i collected gpx files from previous runs uh ragnar has a relay that goes through this area and so i had myself and dave both of us had run a lot of with the island as a part of the ragnar relay Mm -hmm. so some of those segments were kind of inspirations for how we might get through parts of the island and so I was able to go on to my own sort of history of running and grab some GPX files and stitch them together. And um, uh, is there, I think there, I'm not sure if there was any other tools, but no, I didn't, did not use the Strava thing. Um, I think I might, you know, I have this feeling that I might've started off with, um, there are different apps that you can use. Maybe even Strava has the feature where you can like use your finger to draw on a map and then it makes a route from whatever you draw. Mm, so I think at the yeah. very beginning, I think I drew a circle around Puget Sound just to ask the, answer the question, how far is that circle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and that kind of made a route that was something, and then it gave me an answer. And so it was, there's a lot of different tools for mapping and creating routes. And I, I, I used a bunch of them in concert. And, mm-hmm. and I'll tell you what, that's, for me, a lot of the fun is just in that looking at maps. Oh, and, yeah. 
Oh my God, it's so much fun. No, no, absolutely. I think there, there is such an, it, it's such an interesting way of storytelling when you are connecting these different places, right? Absolutely. That's absolutely right. It is a storytelling thing. You're right. For 67 hours on the road, where did you sleep? How did you do the sleep thing? So we had, like I said, these designated cruise stops, um, that which, which were essentially aid stations. And we, um, I identified a few of them with that would be likely candidates to for us to be there for a number of hours in order for us to actually have a sleep. Mm-hmm. And this, this gets me to a thing where I was probably too eager to do the right thing in some ways in, and in that I contacted like the state parks and the county parks to say, Hey, I'm planning a thing. Mm-hmm. Could you, would, would it be okay if we stopped? And in, in almost every case, it, it became a, a conversation of, oh, well, you're going to have to apply for a special use permit. And I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I could, but are you sure you want me to? Because this isn't an actual event. It's just two people going for a run. And it just so happens that I'm just asking for permission <laughs> instead of asking for forgiveness. Yeah. And so after a lot of conversations, eventually the the state parks people came around. They're like, oh, okay, now that we understand what you're doing, no, you don't need a permit. And yes, we will give you permission to use this parking lot overnight instead of, you know, that's designated as a day use only. Mm -hmm. So I did like the idea of making sure that everybody knew what we were doing so that we wouldn't get into any trouble or we wouldn't be asked to leave. Um, There was one county park that actually did give us a piece of paper that was a permit that, you know, after all of this, they actually wanted us to have an official permit. Okay, that's fine. Um, But they did not require us to get insurance. So that was kind of nice that we didn't have that much extra legwork we had to do. But I did talk to um, the various places where we had planned to stop just to make sure we had their okay. And yeah, there are a couple of them we designated, like this would be a good place to sleep or, you know, depending, we're um, so many miles in, like, uh, at mile 80, it just struck me that that'd be a good, there, that parking spot was a good place. We, it, we were finished an 18 mile segment coming into that one. So that was a place we slept. And then there's a couple of times just where we were impromptu, we were just tired. And so we slept where we, where we didn't actually intend to originally, but I think having the plan ahead of time, sort of knowing where we were going to stop and having, having a sense of what were the good places where we could be parked for a few hours uh, was really helpful for us to to sort of make those arrangements. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the conversation we've been having now over the last almost hour makes it clear that one element of your secret sauce, and we didn't even talk about your fitness and your training and your sort of your running history, but it's like, you're such a um, careful and um, serious planner and preparer that I think is lends itself your 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 who you are lends itself to these to these runs right somebody who just wants to fly by the seat of their pants probably doesn't have a lot of success or a lot of fun at these big events right you need you need to sort of have this planning mindset you need to sort of have this the in, enjoyment in in all of this well and i guess you need to have a fiance who's willing to constantly be your crew right i mean really i should talk to her and saying so listen yeah, <laughs> how so is lucky it to have her on the other me. side here <laughs> yeah yeah that's absolutely right i'm so lucky to have such wonderful support uh and Dave too, his, his wife has been uh, a tremendous support to him as well. So we were both really lucky to have that, that loving support that was, that followed us around. And, um, and, you know, at the same, we also had interestingly wonderful support from the community. We didn't expect this, but when we got to Camino Island, we, um, this was on day three, we were pretty tired and uh, we were approaching our first, I think actually, no, I think it was, there was a second stop on Camino Island. We were approaching it and this vehicle drove up alongside of us. And I, she was talking to Dave behind me first. I could sort of hear this conversation happening. And, uh, and then she pulled up alongside me and said, Hey, congratulations. You guys are doing great. I've got, I brought you some soup if you want. I'll be seeing you up at the aid station. And I was like, what is, I kind of thought like, is that Dave's friend? Who is yeah. this person? Yeah. And uh, when we got to that next stop and we we met this person, she explain, explained that she had seen my Facebook post where I had sort of told all of our friends, hey, this is what we're doing. 
And uh, she follows me. We have met at some ultras in the past. And I guess she had previously done a 50 mile run of her own that she had done on Camino Island. And when she did it, she had notified the community and they really supported her. So, so this runner had posted to a Facebook group on Camino Island of residents and basically said, Hey, these two runners are coming through. Let's show them some support. And so she was the first one. And then as we made our way around the Island, there were several other people who stopped their cars to say, Hey, you guys are doing awesome. We've been following you to running past people's homes and they're out in their deck waiting for us to come by. They've been, they were watching us on the tracker and they were cheering us on. So we ended up on this, the third day when we were all pretty tired, we had this incredible boost from the community because there were just a lot of people cheering us on because this local runner had shared what we were doing with that community. And, um, you know, sometimes when you're out doing these events, you know, maybe you don't really get that sort of feedback of congratulations, you're awesome until you're all done. And, you know, you've posted it to your social media or whatever, and now everyone gets to see what you did. It was really neat during this run to have that, that same feedback in real time. And uh, it really helped us get through that day. And it was pretty cool, especially since <laughs> on our way to Camano Island, when we were running through Stanwood, it was, I felt some of the most dangerous that we had to deal with where there was very narrow shoulders and cars driving way too fast and the cars either not giving us any room at all, not moving over. Some cars decide that they're going to be a little bit, uh, I don't know, mm -hmm. funny and mm -hmm. like swerve towards us to scare us. And just after hours of that kind of thing, having a community be so embracing was, was quite wonderful. So we kind of had a, we had the highs and lows. Um, but yeah, it was pretty special to have that community from that community support. That's that's amazing. So are you already plotting new routes around Puget Sound? Is that because I mean it's not you didn't completely circumnavigate the entire Puget Sound. I'm just I'm saying that not because you should have, but because of you know, for people who kind of trying to envision this on the map, right? I mean, 200 miles is an insanely long distance, but even that didn't really capture like everything, right? I mean, there's so yeah. much more to do. Yeah, you know, uh, I think I, I don't have anything that I'm working on yet in terms of a, a new route. Uh, but, uh, well, actually, that's not true. I did. I was playing with some maps <laughs> the other day, um, but they weren't anywhere around here. I was, I was asking myself, well, one of the things I would like to do someday is the Palouse to uh, Cascades uh, route that crosses Washington state. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are other trails, trail systems that cross Idaho and, and cross much of Montana. And so I was recently looking at maps, trying just to look to see what would it take to basically run from Seattle to Missoula on, on all these trails. And um, I don't know if it'll ever happen, but it, it's just interesting and fun to, to dream sometimes. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's just so much fun to just dream and then What's great is when you have supportive friends and family um, to be able to take those dreams and make them into reality, like we did with the Puget Sound 200. It's 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 just it's so creative. I think what your your word of creative storytelling through map making, I feel like is exactly what I got to experience. I created something, and um, there have been uh, runners on Facebook who have asked me about the route, and so you know my hope is that we can sort of the, just build the web page into something which is like here's what we did you know if you want to do it be really careful please but here's the here are the details and maybe it's just something that people can do on their own and maybe it'll just be a little not virtual event but it'll just be a sort of thing that if people want to do it it's it's something that they can um but yeah it's i'll tell you also it wasn't as painful as i expected mm -hmm. so so the whole question of this thing was how hard, much will it hurt and I mean, we were certainly hurting. There's no way you can do these things without it being pain-free. But um, after it was over, I was barely sore. I felt like I've had long training runs that were more painful the next day than the Puget Sound 200 was for me. Uh, and even, um, le well, less than a week later, we were at that trail running conference and I went for the group run. And normally I'm not running three or four days after a 200. And uh, yeah, I... I, I really credit the the Hoka road shoes that I invested in for this thing for for really saving my feet and my and my body. I felt I have had never had such an easy recovery from any 200 as I did uh, for this one. So uh, I definitely learned that it's possible to do. That's for that's, sure. 
It's incredible. Well, and then in the aftermath, you like turned around and immediately signed up for Coca Dona two hundred and fifty. So that's where your where your planning heads. I mean, for somebody like you who runs these two hundred mile distances, how much training do you then do? Because I mean, you're sort of like that's your level. I mean, do you you've done Coca Dona before? Is do you go down there just to have an experience again? Are you challenge yourself? You'd be faster. What's the motivation of keep doing this? Well, in general, I just have, I feel so good experiencing all the highs and lows of a 200 that I, I'm going to continue to seek them out. Um, I'm returning to Cocodona for the fourth time this next year uh, because I've, I'm one of the few runners who have done Cocodona every year that it's been offered. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to do it again. Uh, I'm excited that I will, will have, if I finish it this year, I will have completed more than a thousand miles of Cocodona. So that feels like a pretty neat thing. Um, and, you know, I've just been really lucky that my experience at Cocodona has been shared on my YouTube channel for lots of people to see. And so when I go there, there are a lot of runners who are on that course because they saw my experience and that motivated them to get out there. So for me, it's a chance to connect with a community that is, that is very closely tied to my own experience. And so being able to see and meet those folks is, is a really nice thing for me to do. Um, so I think I do ask, I have asked myself, what am I going to try to do this year at Cocodona differently? Because in the previous two years I did, um, I think each time I reduced my finish time, uh, let's see, it was like 104 hours. I think it, every time it's been a little like about 10 hours improvement in finish time. So 104 to 94. No, that's not right. Well, I can't remember the, I can't remember the, the numbers <laughs> now, but every time I've done Cocodona, it's been faster. And mm -hmm. so now when I'm thinking about what am I going to do for Cocodona, um, I'm wondering, is it going to be even faster or will I try to just be a lot slower or what? Because, you know, there are certain parts of the course that I've never seen during the daytime. So in order to see it during the daytime, I'm going to have to totally change my approach or, or I don't even know. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of training, I feel like I, I train hard. I mean, it's mostly a, a time thing, uh, but I, I don't train as hard as I could. I, I feel like I should be down in the Issy Alps, a whole lot more training on tra doing vert training. Um, I do some of that, but not as much as I probably I could or should. Um, I feel like at this point, my body is is ready for a 200. It's done it a lot of times. And so I spend most of my training just maintaining that readiness. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of time off now that I'm at the end of this season. And I'm sure in December or January, I'll probably start, you know, kind of getting back into things, have a more serious training schedule. Um, yeah. And then in May, it'll be uh Cocodona for the fourth time. And then I'll probably be looking at some other 200s later in the year uh, because there's so many, there's a lot of 200s that are happening in the world now. It's becoming a more and more popular sport. So I just kind of want to get out there and experience as much of those courses as I can. So two pronged question. For you personally, which is the most beautiful one, and for somebody who would want to attempt a 200, which is not me, um, which one would you recommend? Okay, so there's there are many 200s that I have not done yet, so I'm, I can only speak to those that I have done. I think that if I was if I was a first time 200 mile thinker um i might look at the oregon 200 which had its inaugural run this uh, last august so in august of 2023 i ran that in its inaugural year it has a lot of features that i feel like are similar to bigfoot it's running in the pacific northwest forest like bigfoot is but it's not as intense as bigfoot is bigfoot might be one of the hardest 200s that there is um but Bigfoot might also be one of the most beautiful 200s that there is. So I think beauty-wise, well, actually, this is the thing. Beauty-wise, <laughs> Bigfoot is, um, is up there. So is Tahoe, because running around Tahoe mm -hmm. is beautiful. And so is Moab. Moab is beautiful. So I guess it just depends on what you're after. If you're after desert or, or high desert like Tahoe or Pacific Northwest forests, 
it's so hard to pick. But I would say that the Oregon 200 is right now, I think, you know, setting itself to be a place that might be a good, uh, it, I hate to say it's a beginner course because it's still really, really hard, yeah. but I feel like it's, it is less intense than the destination trail, uh, races like Bigfoot, Tahoe and, and Moab, but also the Oregon 200 is really, is really crew friendly. So if, if you're a runner who wants to have a crew join you, um, go beyond racing, which puts on Oregon 200 has really been thoughtful about their approach to having crew on the course. And so, uh, I think it's a good one that people should have a look at, but, but yeah, you know, God made a beautiful planet and it's, it's hard to say which one is the most beautiful because they all have, uh, amazing things going for them. Would you ever consider taking on like Tour de Jean's in Europe? I mean, is it something on your radar? Yeah, Tour de Jean is on my radar. I have a few friends who have done it and it's terrifyingly difficult. I think it has like mm. 80,000 feet of vertical gain. Um, but yeah, I, I would like to to try to get into that. If not, uh, maybe in 2025, I might try to go for that. If not in 2024, I have to... A friend, my friends who I've talked to have said that it's possible to get into. It's not one of those races that's impossible to get into. I just sort of have to do a little bit of my own research about how to apply and how I get into all that. Um, but that is something that I would like to do, although it's, you know, it's terrifying and intimidating. But uh, I once had somebody tell me that the thing that scares you the most is the thing you need to do. And so I think that the fear I have of that race is just confirmation that that's something that uh, is on my horizon. I like it. Wes, you were incredibly generous with your time. I appreciate all your sort of insight and storytelling. Again, I mean, it's hard for me. I, I interview people and I so deeply connect with what they're doing. And with you, I respect, but this 200 mile is so much away from my brain. Like it's like, I, I mean, probably also it comes from the fact that I just DNF'd 100K, right? I feel like I'm so far away from even being able to concept finishing something like that um that i'm sort of in awe but also like i i i, I believe everything you say and i can't comprehend it it's beyond <laughs> it's beyond <laughs> so but that also makes it fascinating because i so appreciate people taking something like this on and dreaming this up and yeah there's a lot there i appreciate it Yeah. Well, thanks for inviting me on this. I love talking about this. And, um, and also I, I love talking about this latest adventure. The Puget Sound 200 was, was a really special thing that I didn't expect afterwards that so many people were going to be fascinated by and want to hear more about. Um, and so I think this just motivates me if, you know, being a race director or not, I think one thing I definitely have learned is I really like at least making a route and going off and running it. And so I'm going to continue doing that, whether or not they actually become commercial events. Uh, I, I foresee a lot more fun little fat asses uh, for people to get invited to join me on. And there's, there's a big world out there that we don't, we don't need permission to explore. We could just go out there and do it. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing what else we can do. There, there is something fascinating. I, a few years ago, I ran every single street in Olympia and I just got a call from somebody who helped his friend run every single street in Lacey, the city next to Olympia. And they were inspired by uh, what I had done several years ago. And there's something, there's something true. It's fascinating putting routes out there, storytelling. It's fascinating connecting with people over, over something like that. And in some respects, as much as it's, is still 200 miles around future sounds, it's, it's not accessible, be, but because of the geographic nature becomes a, approachable understandable paths right people get what you were doing even though they don't right and so i think <laughs> yeah. there, there's something there's something awesome about that yeah wes um lastly let's quickly share have you share some links where people can connect with you we'll make sure that we have all important especially your strava run around peach sound 200 and any information on your upcoming race in the show notes but give people some links where they can learn more about you Yeah, great. Um, on Instagram, I am mid pack elite. And on, uh, if you look on YouTube, just search for my name, Wes plate, you'll find my YouTube channel. Uh, westplate.com has a link, uh, is a link to all my ultra history. So from there, you can see all the ultras that I've run with links to videos, links to Strava. Um, 
And then uh, copperkings100.com will have information about the upcoming 100 miler in Butte, Montana. And PugetSound200.com is where you can see the course that we did this around Puget Sound. But yeah, we'll make sure we get you a map for your show notes and uh, get all those links. And so yeah, come follow along, check me out, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll keep doing cool stuff. I, I, I like talking to a techie. You have like all the domains and you've got all the websites up. I appreciate that. That's amazing. <laughs> it's, part of, it's all part of the fun. <laughs>